My name is Curry Jones. I'm 22 years old, and I've been a follower of Jesus since I was 20 years old. I grew up in the church. I was baptized whenever I was 12 years old. Uh, I didn't really know what it meant to follow Jesus. Um, sophomore year in high school, I started hanging out with um, a bunch of people, smoking, um, drinking, doing a bunch of things that I shouldn't have been doing, living a really unhealthy lifestyle, and just doing a bunch of things that the Bible says that you shouldn't do. I never really knew what it meant to follow Jesus. During my sophomore year in college, I had a friend tell me about Jesus, and he got me interested in reading the Bible. So I started reading, and I started changing a few things in my life, and I felt like God wanted me to stop partying, but I wasn't ready to give that up. And so I uh, finished my sophomore year of college and was hanging out with some friends. We were doing drugs, and I heard an audible voice in my head that told me that I was going to hell. After that night, I felt like I was condemned. I thought I had blasphemed the Holy Spirit, and I thought that I was going to hell. And uh, about a week later, I was over at a friend's house. We were smoking, and I was listening for a voice to see. I would ask, can I still go to heaven, and listen to see if I heard a yes or a no and I thought I heard a voice, and I said, I can't understand what it's saying. And all of a sudden, I got gripped with fear. I've never been this scared in my entire life. The voice said, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? And I said, yes. And he said, stop doing drugs. And the voice faded away, and from that moment on, I never touched an illegal substance ever again and I still struggled with my salvation for about another year after that, but God walked with me through that and um, has helped me to just believe that, man, there's no sin that's um, more powerful than the cross of Jesus. Since meeting Jesus, my attitude has taken a complete 180. Um, I am more selfless. I love my neighbor more. I am willing to help out wherever I can. I was at a point in my life where I felt like I couldn't be forgiven, and God, um, in His grace, saved me from the things that I was doing. And so there is no one that has done anything that is so bad that they can't be forgiven. God just wants you to walk with Him each and every day, and it is a rewarding and fun experience to walk with a God who loves you and who would die for you and who wants to live forever with you in heaven. Fitting, at Memorial Day weekend, my grandfather, a veteran, uh, I'm named after him. He's John Weldon Witten. Uh, he's the original. I'm the knockoff, John Weldon Witten II. And uh, he uh, went to be with the Lord this week. And our family, he's nine, he was 92. Our family grieves, but we don't grieve like the rest of the world with no hope. We grieve knowing he's with the Lord. He was a faithful uh, father, a faithful churchman, uh, a faithful follower of Jesus, a, a faithful member of our country, served all with dignity and with respect. One of the my, my favorite memories of my grandfather uh, is, is not something um, th that he just told me with his words. It's something I saw in how he lived his life. He retired. He was in the, the he, he wasn't a dentist, but he built bridges and crowns. He was an excellent craftsman. Uh, some of you may have part of stuff what he's made in, in your mouth. I don't know, but uh, he's a he was a great craftsman. And when he retired, my grandmother was suffering from depression, Parkinson's disease, a whole lot of other things. She had to be in a nursing facility. And so every morning he would get up, go to the nursing facility, help get her out of bed, get her to breakfast, hang out with her that morning, uh, do lunch with her, and then uh, get her down for her nap. He would go 15 minutes back home, take his nap. He would go back over there, 15-minute drive, uh, get her out of bed, get her to dinner, spend time with her, put her back in her bed. He would go back to his home, do... Uh, watch TV, and he did that for nine years after he went to bed, nine years. Uh, and I saw what, what, what marriage looks like, what service looks like, you know, this idea that marriage is about getting my needs. No, 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 he, yeah, he, he served. 
and he loved well, and he did that in all aspects of his life. So I'm thankful for him. It'll be my honor uh, to be able to officiate his service on Saturday in Georgetown. It's going to be a tremendous celebration of life because God gave us a wonderful gift, and my grandfather taught us a lot about life. Today we're going to be in Luke's Gospel, the 24th chapter, and uh, I want you to think for a moment. Are you somebody who likes surprises? To me, it just depends. What's the surprise? And I'll tell you if I like it or not, right? This morning at 5 a.m., someone decided to ring our doorbell. I don't like that surprise. And you can come over and get my kids back to sleep next time you want to do that, whoever did that. Uh, thank you. Really, really big thank you. Now, the other thing this week, my, my wife surprised me uh, with, with a scavenger hunt. Uh, we, we knew we were having a, a, a child, and she lied to me, and she said she didn't know the gender. And she, but she lied to me. I want you to hear that. She lied to me. And, and so I didn't know the gender. And so I even asked her, do you know the gender? No, I don't know. Well, we went on this scavenger hunt, and we found out we're having a boy. So we're going to have a boy. So we're excited about that. Now, now the big question is the name. What are we going to name the boy? And, and it's got to start with an S because we've got Sam, we've got Sarah, we've got Savannah. So it's got to start with an S. And, and I'm voting for George Springer. But, but take the George off and just go with Springer, right? I mean, he was the 2017 World Series MVP, plays for the Houston Astros. It doesn't get any better than Springer. And I can't understand why she doesn't go for that. She's vetoed that. I don't understand it. Uh, but that's a good surprise, uh, at least finding out it's a boy. To her, finding out that I want to name her Springer, not a good surprise to her. But nonetheless, it, it's a good surprise. But, but it depends on the nature of the surprise. Maybe you've watched the, the show Undercover Boss, and you know uh, that in that show, the boss, the CEO, will often go undercover, uh, dressed as a frontline employee or even maybe even a customer, and will, will work, and, and the other frontline employees and customers don't know that it's actually uh, the CEO. Well, in our text today, Jesus is going undercover. Uh, it's a post-resurrection encounter. Jesus, on Friday, has been crucified. Sunday morning, he's risen. Uh, reports are circulating that he has risen, but the disciples uh, are, think that it's nonsense. The women are reporting that he's risen, and they think that it's nonsense. It's, and so the disciples hadn't seen Jesus yet, and they're on the road to Emmaus, Cleopas and his companion, and they encounter this person that we're going to know is Jesus, but they don't know that it's Jesus. And we're going to see how they were confused, and we're going to learn something about what we ought to do when we're confused. Uh, but Luke, uh, the 24th chapter, uh, there's a lot of text this morning, so we're just going to read it in sections to, to make sure we don't get lost in all that's going on here, because there's some really good uh, truths here. It says in verse 13, Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus. Again, this is Sunday, Easter Sunday. About seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. So reports are circulating that the tomb is empty, but they think it's nonsense. They don't know. And, and so they're, they're confused. And if, if there's a word, they were puzzled. They were puzzled. There's they're just having a hard time putting the events of the weekend together, like, like trying to put together a puzzle where you have, you're operating with two different com sets of puzzle pieces. You have Jesus' death, and, and that in itself was very puzzling. We'll talk more about that in a moment. And, th and then you have the resurrection, which that's a puzzle piece that just we don't really even comprehend. There's not even necessarily a piece for that part of the puzzle. It's just a missing piece. And, and so this puzzle had led them to confusion, kind of like waking up from a bad dream. Towards the end of the dream, you start to really feel that reality. And maybe even in your dream, you start telling yourself, okay, that's not real. That's not what really happened. But when you wake up, your, your heart's uh, pounding, your, your chest is beating, and you're, you're thinking, Okay, I'm glad this isn't real. I'm glad this isn't real. This isn't real. Okay, I, uh, if it was, I'd be really sad if this was real, or I'd be in a lot of trouble. But you, but you feel that. And so Cleopas and his companion are in that moment where, where Jesus has been crucified. Now reports are circulating that Jesus has risen, and Cleopas and his companion are just confused. Like, like two talking heads debating. That's what the text says they're doing. They're debating. What does this mean? How, how can Jesus be dead, first of all, given all that he taught about the kingdom of God, all that he, the hope he wanted to bring, how can Jesus be dead? And then reports of his resurrection, we don't even have a box for that to fit in. And so they're trying to piece together all that they had witnessed. 
They hoped that Israel would be liberated from pagan domination. That They hoped that with Jesus they would finally be able to serve God in, in true peace. That Rome would be gone. That they would be able to worship God with true holiness. And then crucifixion. Devastating. It wasn't just that Jesus had been the bearer of their hopes and now he was dead and gone. It was sharper than that. If Jesus was going to be the one that redeemed Israel as his followers believed, then he should have been the one defeating the pagans, not dying at their hands. And so they're just confused because the puzzle piece just doesn't seem to fit together. You ever felt that way about your life? You got all these different puzzle pieces on the table and they just don't seem to connect. They just don't seem to fit together. You may wonder, okay, why did these certain bad events happen to me? I don't really like that puzzle piece. I don't know how that fits in. But let me also say, if we're going to ask that question, we've also got to flip, flip it around to be fair and say, okay, why did these good things happen to me? Confused. Who is God can be a confusing question. So who is Jesus can be a confusing question. If God is good, then, then why all the suffering? That could be a confusing question. Uh, if God is for me, then, then why is something that I have so desired not come to happen in my life? If I've been walking with Jesus and, and doing what he says to do, why are, why are certain things not working out for me? We, we can be confused about which way to go and which way is right and which way is wrong. We, we can be confused about what God wants to do. Not all of our confusion is necessarily about morally right or wrong things, but just, God, I thought it was your will for me to go this direction, and now, God, I feel like you're calling me to go this direction. Cleopas and his companion are confused. They're puzzled. They're debating all the events of that weekend, death and resurrection. And how does that all fit together? And then Jesus comes in, as he does to our confusion. But the disciples, the text says in verse 16, are kept from recognizing him. I think that's an important distinction to make for us. Important question to us. What keeps us from recognizing Jesus' work? thought about that? Maybe Jesus works in a way we've never experienced before. Maybe Jesus works in a way that's never been documented before. The Holy Spirit can work in all kinds of ways. won't be in ways contradictory to the scripture, but maybe Jesus is working in a way that's never been documented before. Maybe Jesus is working in a way that you didn't expect him to work. But it keeps us from recognizing his work in our life. And what happens in our confusion is that we start to miss the overall story of Scripture and what God's doing. So sometimes we miss the forest for the tree, which is an expression to say sometimes we don't understand or appreciate a larger situation, the larger context we're in, because we're considering only a few parts of it. We're only looking at the trees, certain life events and circumstances in our life, instead of the overarching sweep of what God wants to do what's already been revealed in the scripture. So let's continue reading in verse 17 through 19. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? And so the circumstances of the past week, again, remember Jesus' death, Reports of resurrection have, have led them to be confused. And, and, and the text says they're, they're, their faces are downcast. They're gloomy. They're mourning. They're in sorrow. They have a, they have a, there's a slow, sad dismay at the failure of human hopes. And so they're just trying to turn to somebody, anybody, who can help them try to settle all this confusion. Now, they don't know that it's Jesus, but they act as if... Jesus doesn't know their circumstance. And, and Jesus comes along in verse 19 and he plays dumb. What things? Kind of like a parent that knows what the child has done. Our parents know a lot more than we think they know, right? And so the parent knows that you've done something. Well, tell me, no, what things? Mom and dad, I've messed up. No, 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 tell me. Let's talk about that. What things? And these two are wondering, You've been living under a rock? Everybody in Jerusalem is talking about Jesus and the king of the Jews, and he's been crucified, and now reports are spreading and circulating. And so they, they recall, Jesus lets them go. Verse 19, what things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, he was a prophet. 
powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. So Jesus, here, what things? What things? And they, and they recall all these different things that have happened, who Jesus was, what, what he had hoped for, what they had hoped for. And we learn something here. Again, they don't know they're dealing with Jesus in the text. We know that, but they don't know that. What we can do is we can share our confusion. They're confused and they, they share that confusion. We can share that confusion with other people, with other friends on the journey. But, but we need to be sharing that confusion with God. Now, this took courage because, again, Jesus um, was a threat to Rome. He was a threat to, to, to the Israel and the status quo. And so it took courage because there very well could have been spies that were out there trying to find anybody associated with the Jesus movement. And so it took courage for Cleopas and his companion to share their story. But what we see in the Scripture is that we have a God who came to be among us, to, to dwell among us. And that this God understands our suffering. And that this God understands our confusion. And this God understands our anxiety. The Bible says we can cast all of that anxiety on him. God's word, Philippians 4, 6, says to pray about everything. Everything. So, so we can bring that confusion to God in prayer. And that, that's a great benefit of our relationship with the Lord. But let's look in verse 25. It, it goes on. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them all that was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. You know, sometimes our circumstances cause us to miss the larger picture of what God is doing. We get so focused on, on one event or two events, on this tree, on this tree, on this tree, circumstances, money, suffering, and we miss the larger story that we're a part of and the, uh, and the promises that God has given us. We, we miss the forest through the trees. But we see again, the principle we can live by when we're dealing with our confusion is we listen for Jesus' response. Listen for Jesus' response. And that response is largely going to come from the Scripture. Now, the Holy Spirit can speak through us and to us. And we can hear from God on the golf course. And we can hear from God uh, when we're in a conversation with a good friend. We can hear, for God, hear from God when we're listening to music. We can hear from God on our back porch. But, but God's Word speaks to us. And so often we're wanting God to speak to us. And we have a closed Bible when, when, when if you open the Bible, we might hear a word, we, we will hear a word that will speak to where we are. And then when we, we listen for Jesus' response, what we do is we apply God's word, apply scripture to our situation. Now, not every decision we're going to have to make is going to have, we're going to be open to the Bible and go, okay, who to marry? It, it's right here. But you can see principles of, of what a godly person ought to look for. And you can apply God's word to that situation. And that's what's going on here in this text. Okay, here's what we know from God's word. Let's apply it to the situation with Jesus. Now let's read verse 28 through 30. It says, As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if we were going further. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. So the disciples get the sense. Here they are confused. Cleopas and his companion, excuse me. A part of Jesus following, not necessarily one of the 12 or 11. The disciples get this sense that, that he's with them and, and that this guy understands what, what's going on. They don't understand that it's Jesus at this point, but they ask him to stay the night. I mean, they realize these two guys are just talking heads. Cleopas and his companion. It may have been Cleopas and Mary. We're not, we're not sure. They're just talking heads, but we've got an expert in our midst. So maybe we ought to listen to the expert. And it says in verse 30, when, 
When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. And then, verse 31, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? It was interesting. Here Jesus is having a meal. It was a few nights before the Last Supper. He was having a meal. And he said, do this in remembrance of me, that when you break the bread, you'll remember me. And it's Jesus' gratitude. It's his, it's his thanksgiving. It's his generosity. It's sharing with him that leads them to recognize who he is. The sudden realization that, that Jesus, in our confusion, now he's present with us. He's warming our hearts to the truth. He, he's showing himself as bread is broken. And Cleopas moves from they crucified him, we had hoped he would redeem Israel, to they crucified him, and that's how he did redeem Israel. It's Jesus sharing a meal with his friends. And he told the disciples a few days earlier, do this in remembrance of me. And now it's over this meal that Cleopas and his companion discover that the curse has been broken, that death has been defeated, that God's new creation is brimming with new life and with new possibility and with new joy, and that that has actually burst in upon the world of decay in their confusion, in their sorrow. Here is God coming to be among them. And church family, we too have been invited into that grander story of what God is, is doing. And, and he's showing us here how to have gratitude and generosity. And it's actually the divine gratitude and generosity that lead the two to discover God's identity. It's the familiar elements of bread and wine that help the disciples discover the divine. It's the familiar elements of the bread and the wine that help the disciples discover the divine. You know, sometimes, maybe you're like this, I'm like this. Sometimes we're looking for God and the extraordinary, and God wants to find us in the ordinary. So sometimes we're looking for God in the extraordinary, and God wants to come and find us in the ordinary. Breaking bread with friends sharing about the scriptures together, giving thanks to God, sharing a meal. It's the ordinary practices of sharing that confusion with Jesus, of, of offering gratitude for, to God for good gifts, of sharing a, a meal with good friends that, that point to the bread of life. It, it's, the, it's, the, it's the ordinary elements of a meal that help orient Cleopas and his companion as to the grander story that they are witnessing you see, Cleopas and his companion had been reading the scripture through the wrong end of the lens. They saw suffering and a long story of what God wanted to redeem Israel from suffering. Instead, it was the story of how God would redeem Israel through suffering. Do you see the difference? They thought they were going to be delivered from suffering because Jesus, and then Jesus died, Jesus resurrected, and they understand Jesus redeems them through their suffering, through his suffering, most importantly. And so the discussion underscores the traumatic events surrounding Jesus' death and then his resurrection were all a part of God's plan of deliverance. And so with the resurrection, what they see is not the end of hope. It's the beginning of hope. You know, so often in our life, we come to a situation that, that we face, tragedy, suffering, whatever it might be, and we think this is the end. This is the end of the road. There's, there's a sign with, with, with red and white, and it's there, and, and there is no further. But what we discover in the story is that actually the resurrection is not the end of hope. It's the beginning of all of our hope. And they said, you know, we, our, our hearts were burning with us, with you with us. Have you ever been told a joke and you really don't get it? but you don't want to let people know that you don't get it. So you just laugh, courtesy laugh, and, and just hope that you don't really get asked to explain it later. Cross your fingers. I don't know if that's what's going on with the disciple, with Cleopas and his companion. I'm not sure. What we do know is that at first they didn't really fully understand what was going on. But when the scriptures were shared, they looked back and they realized there was a point when their attitude changed a bit. The rhythm of their heart started beating to a different tune. 
You see, grounding ourselves in God's word helps provide an anchor for us. And when we're confused and when we're frustrated and when we're dejected, we have a compass that, that, that can point us true north. You know, this week, we were not only dealing with the loss of, of my grandfather and, and, and just sad. I mean, 92, that's a great run. That's great. We're, we're sad. That, that, that's a sad thing. We didn't expect it to happen on Thursday morning. And then other events in our life that my wife and I are just sitting there looking at going, okay, Lord, what are you doing here? This just seems really confusing. Where are you? What are you trying to do? What are you trying to accomplish? And some frustration that started to set in with that. But, but it was Wednesday morning, uh, the morning I usually take to, to study, that, that I was opening up the scriptures and, and reminding myself of these truths for ourselves. And, and, I, and I witnessed this just overwhelming peace that came. My heart started beating. Instead of being anxious and, and worried about events to come, I just started to remember, John, remember the story you're a part of. Remember the story that I'm doing. And, and you play a role. You're not the star role. Uh, you're not the finishing role. You're not the closing role. You're not the starting role. You're just a part of that. But you're, you're going to play a part in that. And, and, and so keep, keep doing that. And, and, you know, that's often how Jesus will reveal himself to us. When we get to a point of, of looking in the scripture and seeing what he wants to do, and, and, and God will often work kind of like that sunrise this morning where the sun just doesn't, it's not straight up noon with 102 degree heat. God will start with, with a, a slow sunrise and, and gradually start to warm our heart. And labor, later we're able to see how God moved us through and how God was actually revealing more and more truth to us. And so we learn something, I think, from this text about how important it is that when we're facing confusion, when we're facing challenges in our life, we bring it to Jesus. We, we share that with him. We, we learn to listen to his voice. We learn to apply his word to our situation. And we warm our heart by, by enjoying that fellowship that comes with being a part of his family and being a part of a community with other believers. And so we pray for his presence. We ask for his guidance. And whenever we find ourselves confused, we open his word. Now, we've got to be prepared. This happens to me. I'm sure it'll happen to you. Maybe you've got it all figured out. I don't. But if, I need to talk to you about that. But notice how Jesus also rejected their false understandings. He's not going to completely let you, complete, he's not going to let you stay in that spot of, uh, of, of saying wrong things, of being confused. He wants to help you understand who he really is. But, but Jesus shows up to confused people. And to me, that's the hope of the text. He shows up to confused people. And verse 33 tells us they, they got up and they returned to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true. We, we've heard all the reports. We've heard all the talking. The talking heads have been talking. We've seen it with our eyes. And it is true. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. I imagine chill bumps just started going all around their neck and just the hair on the back of their neck standing. It's true. This isn't a rumor. This is true. And then the two told what happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. You see how profound that is? We need to share our experience with Jesus. There are other people that need to hear that. It's the culmination of our stories that we share together that help us move from despair where Cleopas and his companion were to delight to now this is God from we're downcast and we're gloomy and we're dejected and we're depressed and we're confused to now it's true we've seen the risen Lord and we're delighted and we can't wait to tell other people about him. It's so important to share our, our story with Jesus because sometimes we get so locked in to the tree that's in our life we miss the forest of what God's doing and everybody else's because we're so focused on the tree that's right in front of us. You know, anytime, uh, you know, some folks think here at the church we live in an ivory tower. We don't ever have any frustrating days. Things aren't ever challenging. People don't ever get mad. People don't ever get upset. That's not true. It's a great church, but it's, we got people. We got people, you got problems. That's just reality. But anytime I get discouraged... Or I come home wondering, what good did I, are we accomplishing? Are we? My wife, in her infinite wisdom, will frequently say, when was the last time you took somebody to lunch? When was the last time you just heard what God was doing in somebody else's life? Because it, it's those conversations when I start to discover, and I need those reminders. I start to discover what God is doing in our midst again. 
Because what I've often found is that when I'm confused, when I'm dejected, it means I'm not looking and listening in the right places. I'm not looking and listening in the right places. And, and it's the culmination of these followers of Jesus and their stories, of our stories, of listening to other people and how they encounter Jesus that helps transform our despair into delight. And so the, the road to Emmaus is just the beginning as we understand who Jesus is and what he wants to do in our, in our lives. My story as a Christian began in, in a Christian home. My dad was a, a pastor, and I followed my dad around the church on Sunday. It was a small church, so it's a small, ch- a small church. You're the pastor, you're the preacher, you're the administrator, you're the youth pastor, you're the education minister, you're the custodian, you're the coffee maker, you're all this kind of stuff. And so we go around the church and set the coffee on Sunday morning. My dad hated coffee, but that's what he had to do. He was the pastor. And we'd go set the thermostats, and, and I, I literally rode my dad's coattails. And, and at the age of eight, I went to visit my grandparents, my papa who passed away this week, in Georgetown. And when you're a pastor's kid, you're up a, a good Baptist, your parents strategically send you on a week when they're having vacation Bible school. They think, oh, that's going to be fun. We know you just had it at our house, but it's secretly, it gives your parents a break and it gives your grandparents a break. I'm on to the trick now, but that's what happened. And so they took me to vacation Bible school, First Baptist Church of Georgetown, and at eight years old, I gave my life to Jesus. I knew I was a sinner and I knew I needed his grace. And I've been following him ever since. I haven't been always faithful in that journey. I've done my own thing. It was in high school that I, I really was, felt called back to that path, and I felt like God was called me to full-time ministry. It hadn't always been easy, but I've seen the Lord's faithfulness through a season when both of my parents were unemployed. I've seen the Lord's faithfulness when I've been unfaithful to the Lord. I've seen the Lord's faithfulness when heroes have passed. I've seen God's faithfulness in seasons of doubt. I've seen God's faithfulness in seasons of difficult diagnosis for our family. I've seen God's faithfulness when we experienced a miscarriage. I've experienced the joy of the Lord through marriage. I've experienced the joy of the Lord through children. I've experienced the joy of the Lord through good, deep-spirited friends. I haven't always understood everything. Paul says this side of heaven we won't. But I've seen the Lord's goodness and faithfulness. What's your story? We, we prepared this for you at the beginning of our journey six weeks ago. If you didn't pick one up, you can pick one up today. It's not too late. But we believe our stories are so important, mainly because God's at work in them. And whether it's through our fear or unhealthy hunger or our doubt or our grief or our failure, The story of Jesus is the story of a God who comes to be with us, where we are, to transform us and to make us more like him. And I think it's really important that we capture that story, that we understand that story so that we can share that story with others. So I would strongly encourage you, take this, if you haven't, and fill it out. Ask the Lord for opportunities to share your story with other people. How has Jesus made a difference in your life? You see, it's really very easy. Cleopas and his companion, it is true. It's true. And so I'd encourage you to share it. I'd encourage you to share with our staff. Type it, scan it, email it to us. I'd love to read your story. I'd encourage you, we're going to put it on our Facebook thread this week. Share your story on Facebook. Share it with your friends. It's your story. And maybe you're here today and Jesus, you're not really sure how he fits into your story. The truth is God wants a relationship with you. And it's important that we have a time in our life when we say, you know, Lord, I'm going to follow you. You're going to be the Lord of my life. You know you've sinned. You say, I know I've sinned. I know I've missed the mark. But, but I understand God's grace in more ways, in powerful ways. I realize God still loves me. Like Curry shared in his, his story that there's nothing that you can do that, that the cross of Christ can't redeem. And so let me just encourage you to consider that offer today. It's the most important decision you will make in your life. And today, if you're ready to put your faith in Jesus, if you're ready to have Jesus and to realize how Jesus is a part of your story and how you need Jesus in your story, let me encourage you to do a couple things. Take the connection card in the chair in front of you and fill it out. And check the box that you're ready to follow Jesus. And we want to get with you as soon as we can. Or come see us today. Don't leave today without doing that. But the Bible promises that he who is faithful and just will forgive us. 
and that grace is an offer to all who want to receive it, that the good news in Christ Jesus is that God is no longer holding our sin against us, that we are new creature, new creatures, new creation, that the old life is gone, and your story can now be rewritten. You can follow Jesus, and he will turn your despair into delight. Let's pray. Oh God, we thank you for your love and for your grace. For those in here who are considering following you today, I pray that you would reveal more and more yourself to them. And that like that road to Emmaus, that they would realize how you've been warming their hearts and preparing their hearts. And, and, and I pray, Lord, that today is the day when they say, I'm ready to follow you. So we believe today that you want to have new brothers and sisters in the family of God. And so I pray that anybody who's sensing that, believing that, feeling that, that they're a sinner and that they understand more and more your grace today and they want that and they want to follow you, I pray that they would be bold and share that. Come see us. And Lord, I pray, pray for the rest of us. Is, is just life can get confusing and we see different circumstances in our life. We see the, the different trees and sometimes we miss the broader sweep of what you're doing. Lord, help us to share that confusion. Help us to listen to your response. Help us to apply your word, your wisdom to that situation. And then share your response. Share our experience with you, with other people. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.